Welcome to Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red Channel. I'm Guy Clark. After a brief summer hiatus, we're back and raring to go to dive into the Reds' preparations for the new campaign and consider how well cooked they are ahead of the new season in the raging summer sun. With me, as ever, our resident tactical whiz, Josh Williams. Josh, how are you faring in these boiling conditions? Yeah, not not great, mate. Um it is, it is extremely hot where I am at the minute. I just checked my phone, actually. It's currently 37 where I am. So, ridiculous UK heat unheard of. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to last throughout the episode without melting into my chair, I think. Yeah, I think our non-UK listeners are, are, and viewers are probably thinking, come on, what are you, what are you doing? It's, it's surely not that bad, but I can say uh, fair-skinned, overweight, balding chap like myself was definitely <laughs> not built for this kind of weather. So, uh, yeah, as you say, Josh, let's try and try and get through without melting. But in terms of what we've got in store today, we're going to kind of take a, a bit of an overview. We we did forget to mention the, in the last Analyzing Anfield episode that you were going to be away on, on holiday for a little while. So apologies to anyone who was uh, expecting analyzing Anfield episodes to drop that weren't there as I say that uh, that was certainly something we forgot to mention last time we were together but in terms of kind of what we've missed out on <clears throat> as I say I think it's three weeks since our last recording and in that time Mohamed Salah signed a new contract Liverpool have returned to pre-season they've been out to the far east and back as well plenty's been going on it has yeah and I think first of all before I touch on things that have been going on um I think this is probably the longest break that we've ever had since we started on Latin Anfield a few years ago. And, you know, Dave had a break which coincided with mine. We weren't really aware of that. But I have had a lot of messages since we've been away from just listeners of the show wondering where it is, how long it's going to be before we're back. So thank you for those because they, they do mean a lot. They show that, you know, people are missing us on their, their weekly schedules or whatever. So those are always nice to get. But as I said, we're back anyway. And in terms of Liverpool, Salah news probably is the biggest. You know, that was something that we've touched on a lot of times during the, sh- during the show over, the- over this period of months. So it's going to be nice to talk about that one. Obviously glad they happened. And in terms of pre-season, I'll be honest, I do usually watch pre-season games, but I haven't. I haven't seen the games. So I can only touch, touch on bits that I've seen, highlights, certain clips, all that sort of stuff. But I can't really comment too much on the games because I was in a totally different time zone. No, fair enough. As as were Liverpool themselves. But anyway, let's yeah, let's yeah, talk yeah. about let's let's get into it. So we're going to talk about Liverpool, how they're faring up, as well as some of the rivals as well and how their squad building is going. Because as we understand, Liverpool seem to be set and done for their summer some their summer signings in case unless anything extraordinary does appear for them. But a number of the rivals certainly aren't in that kind of position. But but first up, let's let's dive into Mohamed Salah. I know both yourself and Dave had kind of uh, uh, Ed on the side of caution as to whether actually he would sign a new deal. A number of us were, were kind of in the same boat. So how kind of out of the blue and how much of a surprise did you find it that it just happened so quickly? Yeah, I was a bit surprised. But, you know, throughout the year so far, we, when we, whenever we've touched on it, my, my opinion has been that he's probably going to leave. And that was simply because he was asking for so much more than the rest of his teammates. And not only were Liverpool not not willing to pay that much, but I also thought that his teammates wouldn't really accept that. One of the teammates that I thought wouldn't accept that would have, would have been Sadio Mane. And I think his departure is what has kind of opened up this as a possibility, really. Um, getting Mane's wages off the books... And crucially, being able to give Salah a deal that you don't have to then match with Mane has allowed Liverpool to do it. Um, I also think that the, the deal is is heavily incentivised, as uh, from, from what I'm aware of. So his base wage could be relatively close to Van Dijk's, for example. It'll still be more, I assume, but it could be close to Van Dijk's. Whereas, you know, the whole 300 grand thing, you, maybe you move towards that with goals and certain amounts of appearances and things like that and Salah's obviously backed himself to be able to achieve that so all in all if you actually look at it this summer as a whole for example 
Liverpool have got rid of Mane, who was probably on about 200 grand a week. Uh, got rid of Nico Williams, got rid of Minamino, and replaced those players with Ramsey, who's going to be on very little. Carvalho, who's going to be on very little. And Darwin Nunes, who cost a lot, but I think his starting wage, I think he's going to be on about 120 grand a week, which is not particularly high for Liverpool. So if you actually look at the wages in terms of outgoings and incomings this summer, Liverpool are probably still, they've probably saved a, a tiny bit of money, but at, at worst, it's probably still level. with probably the same amount of wage outgoings as it was last season, despite signing Nunes. Um, so overall, you know, I'm happy with it. I think Mane was, Mane's entitled to a change. And I think Liverpool's, Liverpool's attack in particular was, was ready for the change. And it's nice that despite that happening, the best forward of the front three that have been around for the past few years is staying the longest. So, uh, you know, no complaints. Yeah, how important did you find it that actually this deal in the end then did get done? As you say, with, with Mane seemingly knowing that he was departing for, for weeks and weeks straight off the, the back of the, the Champions League final. Then, obviously, Darwin Nunez coming in, but equally he's never played in the Premier League before. He may take some time to adjust. It was really... Fika, albeit with Al Maria and Benfica prior to that, was looking promising. There's a lot of responsibility on Mohamed Salah still, but equally, he's the guy who always rises to that, isn't he? Exactly. And that, that's why it makes sense for him to be the one to keep, essentially. Like, I've wondered for a while now, and I've mentioned it numerous times on this podcast, given how efficient Liverpool's recruitment was, very rarely making a mistake and all that sort of stuff, I always wondered how the club would deal with the front three ageing together towards 30s and declining together potentially and I always wondered how the club would do it and it looks like you know upon reflection now they are selling one letting one run down his contract and probably going to leave for free and extending to keep the best one which I think you know makes plenty of sense really when you look at it Um I do think that although the club have seemed relatively reluctant to lose money and they, they would never admit to being happy with that deal I do think that if you'd have asked a few years ago how do you want this kind of thing to happen I do think they would have preferred to sell one of the front three to cash in on one of them at least just to get in or to fund part of the move for that next man and I think if you look at the, the transfer many go round that happened uh, Liverpool getting Nunes Bayern Munich getting Mane and Barcelona getting Lewandowski I think Liverpool have I've probably done the best deal there, personally. Yeah, it, it seems to be the one with the most longevity and actually investing in the future of the forward line, isn't it? It's not just a case of, of buying who's hot right now. It is somebody who is going to grow and develop. And at the end of the day, I think certainly with, with Barcelona and their transfer policy of buying ageing players, they only bought Pierre and Aubameyang in January. You're, you're buying a player who realistically his best years may well be behind him and you're not sure what he's definitely coming going forward whereas the research and, and data that Liverpool put into these forward players or any player to be honest coming into the club really does tap into exactly how they think they can fit into a system and I suppose with Darwin and kind of moving into the rest of the summer business of of who's come in in Darwin and with Mane leaving and as you say Firmino beginning to to age and probably fall down the pecking order somewhat Maybe it was time and right that Liverpool did bring in a focal point, number nine, who is going to be one of the main goal-getters in the team or certainly contribute more because Diogo Jota, through the first half of last season, proved that there is room in a Jurgen Klopp 4-3-3 uh, system for the centre-forward to be one of the main goal-getters. And Darwin Nunes is certainly going to add to that and, and probably equally eases a bit of the pressure on Luis Diaz to immediately put up Sadio Mane numbers in terms of goals and assist returns. Yeah, well, you, you just kind of stretch that across the whole team. And I think if you look at Jota, I think Jota's maybe slightly less of a possession player um, than, for example, Mane is. I think Nunes is a bit less of a possession player than Firmino is, which is why maybe it makes sense to move towards a 4-2-3-1 as a system. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that happens moving forward. But in terms of Nunes... You know, I know it was a, quite a substantial fee for the services, but 
what what I've come to realise with Liverpool's business is that they don't really mind paying that initial transfer fee really high. It, it's it's more the wages, it's the player wages, whatever the player wants to earn per week that will determine whether he's likely to come to Anfield. Like in terms of Haaland, Liverpool could have paid Haaland's release clause, but the wages and the the additional figures absolutely ruled that one out. Nunes has been signed for, you know, according to some reports, 100 million and all this nonsense. But his, his wages is, is like a third of the wages Jed and Sancho's on at Manchester United, for example. So it's just, it's good business in my opinion. And I know he's had a, well, I was going to say he's had a shaky start. The, the narrative's getting in my head as well, right? Um, he obviously hasn't had a, a shaky start. He's fine. <laughs> but this is the issue with signing a striker. This is the issue with, get, with signing a goal getter, if you like. Um, those players, and I've said this before on the podcast when people have asked why don't Liverpool ever sign a striker, the, the narrative is just so strong around those players. And in order for a striker, a number nine, if you like, to play well, he has to score. And if he doesn't score, the narrative is, well, he's not really doing much, is he? He's not, he's not really doing enough. And with the wide forwards that we've had in the past few years in Salah and Mane, because of their because of their natural wide roles, they could go one or two games without scoring, three games, four games. It's not really an issue because the track and back, the putting crosses in, the creating for others, they're just doing all kinds because of the wide roles. But if you it, that central striker specifically in England as well, there's so much pressure on that player to put the ball in the net like one in every two games. And if he's not doing that, especially if he's cost so much, he will get battered by the media. And, um, you know, the pressure is on him. Do you think, I mean, <clears throat> looking at it for this coming season then, do you think there's more of a possibility and a chance actually that Liverpool, the attack evolves and becomes more complete and not reliant on two players? And just looking at the numbers over the last three seasons and going back to 2019-20, I've got here that in 48 games, Salah got 23 goals, Mane got 20, 22 in, in 47 games. The following season, the 2020 20 and 21 season, Salah got 31, Mane got 16, Jota was the next highest with 13. And then last season, it was a case of Jota got 21, Mane 23 and Salah 31. So since Jota's arrived, he's started bridging that gap. But all of a sudden, there is more than two primary goal getters in the team. You mentioned before, maybe it will be the 4-2-3-1. And I know the last episode we recorded, we started talking about that maybe being a possibility. And Fabio Carvalho in pre-season has looked very lively as well, but equally looks accustomed at playing in that kind of left-hand side of the the, the three-man midfield that, that Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool have favoured for so long. But I just wonder, with that centre-forward, as you say, if they're not in the team and scoring goals, even to an extent last season within the Liverpool fan base, there was a bit of a period of time where just before Jota dropped out of the team, where whilst he was scoring goals, people were saying, well, what else is he doing? But equally, that's what he was there to do. And with Darwin Nunez, it, it, it will be that. But when you, you list off the strikers that Liverpool have available to them in, in Jota, Nunez, Salah, Luis Diaz, and, and Diogo Jota, who they have there, they all, to me, jump off the page and Roberto Firmino are players who will be able to to get goals at any time. And actually, you could see three or four of them actually all on the pitch at the same time. Yeah, and you can you can potentially throw Carvalho into that. And um, you've got set pieces as well. Liverpool, uh, Do you see scored... Carvalho, though? Sorry, do you see Carvalho? I know we've had this chat about Harvey Elliott of actually if he's going to develop into a, a cold killer, as it were, of a goal scorer. Do you see Carvalho with those traits then? Or do you, do you not see him more as a flair creative type? Yeah, well, the, the more I've seen of him and the more I've read about him as well, he's more inclined than you would think to, to, to pop up with the odd goal and uh, to be a little bit of a... Maybe a peak Deli Ali. I don't think he is. I don't think he is that type of player. But I think he's. What I'm getting at is he's got a little bit of that in in him, as well as the standard number ten creative side, a bit more in the Coutinho mould. So, I think he's generally quite well rounded. I know he's very suited to pressing as well. I think he's he's a natural presser of the ball, which you couldn't say about the likes of Coutinho and players like that. Um. So it's going to be really interesting to watch Carvalho this season because I actually think he could be. 
a little bit of a dark horse. <clears throat> a little bit of a dark horse because he's coming as a kid for a nominal fee, you know, four million or something like that. Um, just play for the championship team. So I don't think many people are expecting very much from him at all. And usually when that's the case, it provides a bit of a platform for him to essentially surprise the whole division, really. And I wouldn't be surprised if, especially if Liverpool moves towards 4 2 3 1. I think as the season progresses and gets closer towards the business end, I wouldn't be surprised if he progresses in the same in the same vein, really. And by the end of the season, he's kind of in the run for like young player of the year and things like that. But you know, I am getting ahead of myself there. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's if Liverpool have a bit more of a plan for him than many had expecting, really. I agree with what you're saying there. They're not going to change the system to accommodate a 19-year-old from the off, but equally, if he comes into the team, and and that's the thing I think with him is he will add the ability to be so flexible within game, within shape of if he needs to push in to occupy those number 10 positions, he will equally at the same time, I'm sure he'll dart back out to that that left space to help with the defensive shape that, that Liverpool do try to operate. But as you say, over the course of the season, actually his evolution may be Liverpool's evolution into a 4 2 three, one, so he can occupy him and be in those more advanced positions where he can do more damage to teams on a more regular basis. It is interesting to kind of keep across. But in terms of Darwin Nunez, then and we spoke about it on, on this week's Blood Red podcast as well, in terms of the clips that have gone round, certainly of him not scoring and things. I mean, it's it's you laugh there. It is laughable, isn't it? That two games into pre-season, opposition fans in particular just want to, to jump straight on it immediately when at the end of the day, the guy's within his first or was within his first week of being in training with Liverpool, adapting to new systems and and certainly he looked sharp, but there was all sorts of reports about him him having huge blisters and this, that and the other. And he's he's not been bought to score goals in pre season, has he? Well, again, this is this is the issue with strikers and this is the issue with paying big for them. They just come with so much added pressure. And they do have to score goals to keep the media narrative quiet. Um, e- even a player like Firmino, who was never really a striker and was doing so much more around goal scoring, even he battled with criticism from our own fan base for years because he didn't score enough so much, which was the, you know, a bit of nonsense, really, if I'm honest, because he, he was just so much more than that for the team. And I think that was always fairly obvious. But in England, there's just such a tradition that number nine, that that, that fixed focal point, especially one in the mould of Nunes compared to Firmino, he has to score goals to keep people happy. And in the pre-season game so far, he's been presented with chances. He's been presented with some chances that people would label as scissors. And he's missed the target completely in some of them. And his first touch has looked a little bit dodgy and things like that. But it's for me, it's nothing to worry about. It's it's nothing to be concerned about or anything like that. And what I would get from some of the clips is he is getting in the opportunity areas. He's getting in the right positions. He's getting the shots. And... What the analytics says about that is that the players who get the shots, the players who get in these positions through good movements, good positioning, reading of the game, they get the goals as well. They will come. Uh, when we looked at him over the summer, when Liverpool signed him, one of the things we touched on was how much of a clinical marksman he is. Scores to a really efficient level, quite deadly when he's presented with chances. We obviously haven't seen that yet, but if that comes... He's going to explode, really, because Liverpool will create chances for him all over the pitch. Um, One slight issue that I will bring up is another player who was was kind of like this was was Timo Werner. Um, He's a player who, despite his tendency to miss all the time, (laughs) had this ability to just get in the right spots. He gets chances, his expected goals generally is quite high. But Werner, because of the demand at Chelsea and because of how long it kind of took him to really explode, he still hasn't exploded now, it did get in his head eventually. And he he, he just kind of stopped 
scoring as much and, and just kind of came out the team. And I don't necessarily think that will happen with Nunes, but his ability to keep getting the shots is good enough. But if he keeps missing them, it, it will get in his head because it, it, yeah, just, it, will. Does, it it's, just does it's, with strikers. Yeah, it is a confidence thing, isn't it? And that's why it's a, a cliche yeah. and a well-trodden phrase that we all sort of speak about. Of it's, it's a confidence thing for strikers. It definitely is, but equally, as we say, it, it's only pre-season for him right now. And he, like you say, he's got to be getting in those positions and actually just effectively, it's pre-season for him to make these errors now to then hit the ground running once the season starts. I personally, I'm not entirely sure he'll be starting at Fulham anyway and that he will be the man. I mean, yes, a lot of money has been shelled out to to bring him into the club, but do you think he'll, 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 he'll walk straight into the side? I mean, Diego Jota scored 21 goals in all competitions last season. A large number of that was playing as the main centre forward within the team. Added to that, Roberto Firmino, who, as we said, albeit may well leave at the end of this season on a free transfer, he might not. He may still sign a, a new contract at Liverpool, has, has given great service to the club, and albeit hasn't been the most clinical and deadliest of strikers. But equally, it, it, he's been a very reliable performer. And last year, actually, probably missed a lot of football due to injury rather than selection initially. And then by the time he got himself fully fit around the autumn time, the end of the autumn into the winter, Diogo Jota was in brilliant form and wasn't going to be dropped. So it's not a case of actually Liverpool are reliant. I know what you're saying there about Timo Werner. He was brought in by Chelsea. He was stuck up front. And yeah, you're going to be the man to get the goals. Whereas Liverpool actually don't have the need to put that pressure on him internally. It would only be external noise that can be shut out. Well, I they mentioned this the other week, and uh, my response was that I, I wasn't overly sure whether he would start the first game. But now, I think, after getting Nunes in so early in pre-season, he's now already he's appeared in two games, at least. I know he hasn't played anywhere near a full game or anything like that, but he's appeared in two games so far. And crucially, Joss is injured now uh, at the minute. And his injury could easily take it up to the start of the season, which is in about two and a half weeks. So, I think Nunes, I do think Nunes will start in the first game. But I have a lot of trust in, in Klopp's ability to just manage people, essentially. And I think he will have a really good gauge of, of how Nunes is feeling and the pressure on the shoulders and, and all that sort of stuff. And I think Klopp will do the right thing regarding giving him opportunities to shine and things like that and given his role as a striker and the demand to score goals and stuff I do, I do think he will he will do what he can to to remove that kind of burden off his, off his shoulders because he, he needs to be able to perform in a natural way and if he does that he will he, he will convert his chances to a high level but the, the, the more a, a striker misses his shots he don't, doesn't convert them into goals the more he will, maybe maybe the ball comes to him in the area, and maybe he takes two or three touches before shooting because he wants that perfect shot. Whereas the best marksman, two first time or after one touch, it's just a general thing that just tends to happen. And Nunes has generally been good at that. He scored a lot of goals that season with his first touch. I remember writing the newsletter on that one. So you just hope that he just keeps doing things naturally. Like I don't think it was particularly good that he he's already taken to Instagram to. Or Twitter, it might have been, or whatever, to, to, to post photos. And um, I think he used the word resilience and stuff like that. That's that's fine, obviously, but it that suggests he's already noticed that people are mentioning things or whatever. And I don't know. You you just hope that he's he's going to keep doing things naturally because if he do if he does do things naturally and he plays anything like he played last season for Benfica, he'll comfortably get twenty Premier League goals this season. Yeah, it is the goldfish bowl, though, of being a, a Liverpool centre forward, isn't it? Like you say, the, the magnifying glass very much well and truly out on anything that he does. But as you say, I think far too many people getting excited outside of Liverpool for the fact that he may well not scale the heights that many think he will. And it's not often that Liverpool don't come up with a, uh, a a gem in the transfer market, especially when they invest as much as they have into Darwin Nunez. And as I said, I I, I don't think the pressure is going to be fully on him from the off. We'll have to wait and see how that does play out. But I'm going to use him as a segue and his preseason mm, inefficiencies in front of goal in comparison to another player, a, a top six rival, who have to say I'm 
fully invested in is Gabriel Jesus, who is another who in pre no, but it shows you what preseason's worth, doesn't it? He's he's gone into preseason at Arsenal, he's scoring goal after goal after goal. A lot of Arsenal fans are getting very excited about it. I'm still very much on the fence and waiting to see what he does in competitive action. But I say we're gonna I'm gonna use that as a segue because we're gonna talk about kind of every the, the other top six clubs and how their squad building has been going and, and preparing for the new season. And l- let's start with Manchester City. Of course, they're the closest rival to Liverpool and have been over the last few seasons. They've lost Gabriel Jesus. They've lost Fernandinho. They look as though they're losing Alexander Zinchenko as well. They do seem to have lost Raheem Sterling as well. They, they've, they've lost a, a number of key players this summer. Yes, they've been active in the transfer market, but what's your take on kind of how their squad's coming together? Because to me, from the outside, I think actually it's probably more turnover than than's probably healthy. Yeah, it is really surprising. I tweeted yesterday actually that it's, there's something quite ominous about it. It just feels like, it, you know, because they're edging towards a, a positive net spend at the minute. For the window and it just feels like it just feels like it can't happen <laughs> and it feels like on deadline day they're going to go and bid like a hundred million for like pig zidane or or try and buy barcelona or something like that you know it, it just doesn't really feel real but it's interesting considering last season guardiola touched on and it became a bit of a thing towards the end of the season when people actually started to realize city didn't have that much depth last season <laughs> And whereas they usually clean up across the board when it comes to competitions, City only won one trophy last season, and that was the Premier League. I know they got far in the Champions League and stuff, but the domestic cups usually goes to the club who, which has the most depth. Liverpool got both of them. Chelsea came second in both of them. So considering City needed depth, they're, they're losing a fair few players there. And I think specifically Sterling is is a big loss. Um because he, what they're kind of doing by the looks of it is replacing Sterling and Jesus, two players who have predominantly played out wide in the past year or so, for Alvarez and Haaland, two strikers. So it, it, it looks at the minute that kind of for the first time, really, Guardiola's not really going to have those electric um, 1v1 masters on the flanks. You know, Grealish isn't really that. Grealish is a different kind of winger. Um, Foden, I suppose, is that, you could say. Mares is 31, 32 now, is he? How old is Mares? Um, so he's, he's getting a bit less inclined to take on his opponents 1v1 and threatening them behind and stuff. So it looks like City's threatening behind the season coming. He's going to come through the middle, through Haaland, who's, we're led to believe, maybe is he a little bit injured at the minute or something like that? Um and then on top of that, the US tour that they've just had, John Stones, Phil Foden, and uh, El Kai Gundogan, I think it was, stayed stayed in England for it. Um, so it doesn't look like the best prep for them, if I'm honest, for the season. But it does feel like every every year we kind of pinpoint the odd reason as to why City might fall off <laughs> and they just they just never do it's, I don't think they ever will under Guardiola Guardiola is just a master of accumulating wins in the Premier League and in league competition so I think they'll generally be alright but if you if you look at the, the squad now are they stronger than last season I, I don't know I'm not sure on that but I'm you could say sure. the same about Liverpool as well <laughs> yeah you could I'm, I'm not sure they are but yeah but could it be? The I do. Second? I do like Cucurella. If Cucurella comes in for yeah. Zinchenko, I think that's. I don't know if it's an upgrade, but it's it's all right. I think Calvin Phillips for Fernandinho is a great replacement. I don't know if it's an upgrade, but I think he's he's a whole midfield player, predominantly defensive, and can also play as a centre back, which is essentially what Fernandinho was, and he's homegrown. So I don't think he's an upgrade or anything like that. But it's, if you're looking for another Fernandinho. I think Calvin Phillips is a good solution there. But as I said, in terms of whether they're better or not, I, I'm not sure. Do you think there's there's maybe a hint from them as well that they might revert to a 4 2 3 1? When you were saying there with Phillips, I mean, there's been a lot of rhetoric around Phillips that, oh, he will be 
purely Fernandinho's replacement. And over the last two or three seasons, his minutes have been dropping where he's not been used as much. And Rodri really last season grew into the team and became such a focal point of that. And within that as well was a, a real attacking threat as well on a number of occasions for Man City, even within open play, going from playing in that pivot role to all of a sudden going and joining an attacks and, and getting on the end of crosses in particular into the box. I mean, as you say, they've not got the electric wide forwards of yesteryear that they've had when you think of the likes of Leroy Sane, the likes of, of Riyad Mahrez, as you say, when he was a bit younger, Raheem Sterling as well. Both Mahrez and Grealish are probably more willing to run with the ball than Pep Guardiola is really keen on his players doing. Bernardo Silva can play in a multitude of different positions. And and then when you think you've got Rodri and Calvin Phillips, actually then with a, a focal point, number nine, the like of Erling Haaland or, or Julian Alvarez, who can kind of play, whether it be as a 10 or as a number nine as well. To me, that the, there is that hint, maybe even within their squad, that they're beginning to evolve and, and do something different. But equally on your point before, are they weaker than last season? I'd arguably say yes. And on top of that, were they weaker last season than they were the year before? Again, due to the fact that they lost some depth, I think they were. So it's going to be really interesting. And I don't know about you. I've, obviously, I'm not going to say he won't succeed, but I, I'm really interested to see how Erling Haaland does at Man City. A, because they've not really had a proper out-and-out out forward. Even when they had Sergio Aguero at the club, the initial kind of murmurings were that, that Pep Guardiola wasn't all too keen on him. He adapted his style, started maybe playing a bit deeper and pressing higher up the pitch as well and getting involved in the build-up. Doesn't quite seem to be Erling Haaland's game. And then equally on top of that, they've got the rest of kind of the moving parts. There's been speculation over Gundogan. There's been speculation over Bernardo Silva as well. I just don't think it all sort of seems set at Man City for it to maybe just unqualified be, yep, OK, they're definitely going to be hitting 90 plus points again. Yeah, well, I think in Haaland, you, you, you kind of do really have that, that fixed penalty box poacher who's just going to be an absolute master of putting the ball in the net, really. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Guardiola's been willing to... I mean, they've got one year left on the contract, so maybe that's another reason why they've sold them. But in, in Sterling and Jesus, they're more like inside forwards, really, aren't they? We're going to get goals rather than creating for a man in the box. Whereas if it, it, this season, now looking forward, you may be surrounding Haaland with De Bruyne, Grealish... Bernardo Silva, Foden, you'd say they're more creative players than than than, than a Sterling or a, or a Jesus. So maybe City are undergoing their own little changes there. And but the, the only issue with that is if you're making such adjustments to accommodate a player who does get injured fairly often, that's going to be interesting. How how City manage that? It's going to be interesting to see next season how many injuries he picks up whether it hampers City at all, uh, whether Alvarez can come in and do what Guardiola is hoping Haaland will do. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see whether all these changes are going to be worth it for a player who might not always be on the pitch. Like last season, um, yeah, it looks like he's had a fair few. I mean, just little ones, though. Like, they're, not, they're not big yeah. injuries, some muscular problems. Um, minor knock illness. But that's when a player becomes injury prone, isn't it? A lot of people will say, oh, when a player misses huge swathes of time, oh, he's injury prone. But actually, no. Injury prone player is one who, who picks up a number of niggly injuries consistently. And certainly muscle strains and, and tweaks like that can be something that can be something to, to be worried about. In terms of City, though, and when we compare to what we've said about Liverpool on this podcast, we've said with Liverpool bringing in Nunes and, and Mane leaving, actually, maybe the attack is going to diversify and there will be more goal threats around the pitch. City, it seems to be the opposite. Whilst over the last few seasons, Aguero aside, they've not always had a talisman within the team who's going to get 20 plus Premier League goals. They've always had four or five who will get 10 or 15 each. And all of a sudden, the number collectively is very high. So, it seems kind of counterintuitive that City then moved to a system where it's just all on one man and equally if he, he might be slightly injury prone. But let's move on and talk about the other sides 
in the top six and kind of where they're going. We'll, we'll get to Arsenal, Manchester United maybe a bit later and won't spend too much time on them because realistically they're not going to be a threat to Liverpool. But in terms of Tottenham specifically and Chelsea, of those two, who do you see kind of being, if there is going to be a challenger to Liverpool and Man City this year, who do you think it would be out of out of those two? Or, or would it be one of Arsenal or, or Manchester United? I personally don't see it, but wanted to, to get your take on it. Do you know what? I don't think I can split them. Uh, I've just even tried to think to myself who would be the tougher opponent for Liverpool to face. And again, I can't really split them. I think they're both going to be really difficult to play against. Liverpool played Chelsea four times last season, didn't beat them in 90 minutes once. And we played Spurs twice through both games, I think. Um, And they're only going to be better this season. I do think Spurs are going to be really good this season. I'm really interested to see how they get on. I've said that a few times now. Um, but they're really pushing ahead with the business, shaping the squad exactly how Conte wants it. They've still got Son. They've added Richarlison to the fray. Um, Harry Kane's still there. No issues. So it's going to be... We've got Perisic for the wing-back role as well, which is going to be interesting. So I am really intrigued by Spurs. And Chelsea, just really interesting them in the Chelsea I mean, Sterling, I think, is a really good sign. Kugler Bali is an interesting one. Um, but they still need a fair few defenders, I think. So, I can't... Honestly, you can slip a coin as to who's going to finish there. There are than two for me. Um, See, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit different to you. and I mean, pains me to say, as everyone knows, I'm an Arsenal fan, but I, I think Tottenham are going to be the, the third side, really. I think I think Liverpool and, and City will be looking at 90-plus points again if, if they can get to that. And I think I think Spurs will be in that kind of 80-point bracket. Um, I don't think they'll, they'll, they'll yeah, challenge I too do. much, but when you consider they've already brought in six signings, that they're into pre-season of, of doing that. Conte, you saw the impact he had when he was at Chelsea of what he can do in a pre-season of getting a squad to where he wants them to be. They'll be back of reaching the Champions League and qualifying for that at the back end of last season. And as you say, they've got a couple of world-class operators at the top end of the pitch. And I think maybe within kind of bringing players in, one of the hardest areas to bring a player in, to gel them into the system, to the side, to then have an impact is defensively. We you, you look at the amount of money that Manchester United have wasted on defenders over the last decade, how difficult it's been for them to find the right ones to piece in. And I, I think for Chelsea, as you say, they're, they're two or three short and all of a sudden they're needing to bring these players in. And what are we? We've said two and a half weeks away from the start of the season. The window, the, the, the season this year is, is basically starting right at the beginning of August. So by the end of the window, there's a whole month of the season that will have gone there that actually teams can kind of kind of lose pace in in the race for where it is they are eventually going to finish and personally yeah, I think I think Spurs will be the third team I, I actually think Chelsea might be a team looking over their shoulders a bit this season but I'm sure you'll probably no tell I, me I, I I agree but then I can't help taking note of the the players Chelsea are getting linked with to fill these gaps like to I, I said a few weeks ago that I think Spurs will comfortably be the third best team in the league this season but then I also said, but then you have to see who Chelsea will go for in the market, how they will address the squad. And after just they've just went and got Raheem Sterling, Kula Bali, although he might not be peak and he might be on a decline, I think this season he will probably be still fairly decent level. Yeah. They're getting linked with Jules Koundé. Um so you know, they've got Chilwell to come back, they've got Reese James there, and they've still got a midfield that consists of Kovacic and Kante and players like that. So Conor Gallagher's there now. Uh, so, they still have a ridiculous squad, a great coach, and they're still very hard to play against. They probably will always be very hard to play against. So, I think it's more of a coin flip now. If I was to be absolutely put on the spot, I probably would lean towards Spurs a tiny bit. But, um, yeah, I'm intrigued by I'm intrigued by those two. Yeah, no, I, as I said, I think the Sterling signing for them is, is a good signing, but equally, I'm not sure what he adds different to the squad, maybe availability than than what, say, a, a Pulisic who they've already got in the squad. Mount plays obviously in a similar area. Timo Werner, I think he's more clinical than him and he's certainly an upgrade, but I still think they're probably missing a centre forward and, as I say, at least two, if not more, defenders. be interesting to see how they go. In terms of the others, then Arsenal and, and Manchester United, we'll wrap up quick on them, but what's your take on kind of 
how the rest of the top six is shaping up? I think Arsenal are doing good business. Uh, I'm interested to see how they get on. Gabriel Jesus, I'm very happy that Arsenal have acquired him because he generally plays really well against Liverpool. <laughs> so uh, it would be nice that he, he can't benefit from Guardiola anymore. I think he's a very intense player. I don't think he's the best finisher, but he just doesn't have to score to play well, Jesus. So I think he's a good buy for Arsenal. Sinchenko, I do like him. I think he's a. I think he's a good buy. I'm not sure how he. I'm not sure how much he impacts your points total over the course of a season, and I'm not sure that Arsenal's biggest upgrade was there. But I do think it makes sense considering he can play left back, can play in the centre of the park, very creative wherever he plays. Still 25 years old and he's won Premier League titles, got that degree of pedigree behind him, knows what it takes to win a league and he's been in there at a winning dressing room and things like that, work with Arteta in the past. So overall, two really sensible signings there. Um, so it's going to be interesting again with Arsenal but, uh, and then Man United. I mean, if you look at, this is Tuesday afternoon, if you look at Twitter at the minute, you think Man United are going to be winning the league. Apparently they're just playing well against Crystal Palace right now. Uh Playing ten hard ball and all this, but I still, I still think Man United could have a really good season. They could improve a lot and still finish fifth and sixth. And I, I don't think they will breach the top four personally, even if they do will improve, which I expect. I don't think they're gonna sign the players they need personally. I still think recruitment will always pull them down. I don't think ten hard will ever be surrounded by the experts that Klopp is surrounded with at Liverpool. You, I always remind people that Klopp wanted to buy Julian Brandt when Liverpool went and bought Mo Salah. You know, that's that, that that's the help of the experts around them. And I don't think Ten Hag will ever really be provided with that. They've just bought a a five foot ten centre five foot ten centre half. Now, lots of discourse as to whether that's a thing, whether that matters. Having watched Liverpool for a number of years, specifically trying to play a pressing game with centre halves who are physically dominant. I think it does matter. I think it will have an impact, especially if he's in the back two. Maybe if, he, if he's in the back three, it can be masked a little bit. But if he's going to play a pressing game in every match with a back four and a five foot ten lad's going to be one of your back four, that that looks a bit like a recipe for disaster. But that's that's going to be an interesting one to follow because I've just paid a lot of money for him. Um, but overall, the top six all really look like they've not necessarily got stronger because the only two that maybe haven't got stronger are, are, are Liverpool and City, funnily enough. They, they, they've made... Because you can't really get... How can you get stronger than 90... What was it? 93 points or whatever? And, yeah, 93 you know, and 92. I was going to say Chelsea Chelsea finished on 74, which by my maths is what? Uh, 16 points? 18 points off of Liverpool and 19 off... Manchester City, I might be wrong and someone will correct me for my, my maths being completely wrong on that one. But equally, what we've just been saying, like Manchester United finished 13 points off of Tottenham in fourth. And yet we've just been saying how, how much Tottenham have strengthened. And as you said, I, I, I was amazed that for a third straight season that you had sort of teams being able to continually keep going over that 90 point bracket that Man City and Liverpool have been and perhaps it's natural that there'll be a regression at some point but I still think they're comfortably the two teams out in front and it doesn't particularly matter in one summer how much strengthening any of the other four do I, I just don't see them bridging that gap I think as I say Tottenham are probably the team best equipped to do it in the short term, but equally they've got Antonio Conte as their manager. So that would be in the short term. I can't see him probably this time next summer going again with another recruitment uh, kind of overhaul yeah. like he's done this summer, because that that's not how Tottenham operate. And eventually that will, that will kind of play out how it does where Conte wants, 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 and, and Tottenham won't want to back him continually. Yeah. Well, I think upon reflection now, I think, the team who have actually done the worst business so far, I think, is probably Man United, funnily enough. But the difference with United is they do now have a proper coach in place. And I do I do rate him as a coach. I think he is very good as a coach. So I do expect them to improve, but I'm not sure how much that will be. Um, and I think the teams who have 
have probably made the best improvements in the market is probably Spurs. Um, but then around that, as I said, Arsenal have made good moves. Um, City and Liverpool, are, they certainly haven't declined, I don't think. I think they'll, they'll stay roughly the same level. But I, I do think overall the top six is maybe a bit more congested as a group than, than previous seasons. I think previous seasons it's been a bit of a top two, then another two, then another two or, or, or whatever. But I think this season you might see the top six all a bit more closer together, but without the order changing that much, maybe. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how it does play out. Well, that's all we've time for this week here on Analyzing Anfield. Don't worry, we aren't going to go and do a disappearing act again. We are here now every week through the course of the campaign. Just looking at it, Josh, I imagine next week we'll be previewing the Community Shield with Manchester City and looking back on the friendlies with the Red Bull clubs. And then the following week, of course, it is the big season preview. Dave will be back in position as you two get to uh, make all your fancy predictions ahead of the campaign and, and see how wildly wrong you are come the end. Well, funny enough, actually, I was going to mention this. We are, <laughs> we are, we are debating opening up a, uh, an Analyze Now Field League. Uh, we've never done that before, but we maybe we'll put some interest. We do mention it every now and then on the show. As, as to our fantasy stuff and that. So if listeners want to compete against the the host of the show, maybe, you know. Yeah, if they want to beat a... me, they can absolutely, they can, they, can, they can do that. <laughs> I, I start like a train and then very much fall away and get derailed. I know <laughs> yourself, you're very, very strong. Say that again, mate. You're very strong on fantasy. Say that again, sorry. Yeah, you'd never expect <laughs> you'd never expect anything other from Josh, and, and certainly <laughs> modest, modest with it as well. But anyway, that's all we've time for here on this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield. Thanks for Josh Williams for joining myself, Guy Clark, here for this episode, and for you for watching and listening. And until next time, it's bye for now. <laughs>